I'll, I'll start with something which, of course, is of great interest to people in Mexico, and that what on earth gave us Trump? <laughs> and uh, partly, uh, as much as there seems to be simply madness emanating from the White House, the, the arguments he made about the state of the American economy had a lot of justification. And I'm now caught between watching what's happening, which seems off the scale crazy, with knowing that a lot of what he, his, diag his, his diagnosis, what was wrong, actually was correct. And this contrast to the Democrats, and in particular, well, the economist is probably most associated with the Democrats' uh, attitudes to the economy, Paul Krugman. And he said uh, back in August of last year before the election uh, took place that the major economies, the US and Japan, are close to full employment. And what he was relying upon is this sort of data. This is the Federal Reserve's uh, FRED database. If you don't know it, I highly recommend taking a look at it. It's a brilliant uh, database, both for um, the ease of access and the amount of data that's there. And that's the graph of the unemployment rate in America from 1990 to 2016. And if you look at where the unemployment rate was as of August, uh, it was comparable to where it was back in August 2007 before the financial crisis began. So if you're looking at that data alone, yes, America's back to full employment. But Fred also publishes a data series called the Employment Ratio. And I want to now show you, you know, the employment ratio for people between the ages of 25 and 54, who, of course, are people who most of whom are going to be in, or want to, going to be in full-time work. Only a handful are going to be not in work for reasons of raising children predominantly. And you look at the data which is the red line compared to the blue line I've just shown you, there's nothing like the recovery that's being shown in the unemployment data. And when you actually look at the, the difference between the number of people who had a job back here, when it was employment was roughly 80, 80 and a bit percent of the population of that age group had a job, to now, when the economy is supposedly recovered, about 70, less 77.5 percent have a job. And you work it out, that's 2 million less people taking account of demographic change. Two million less Americans of that age have a job. And compared to back in uh, 2000, before the heavy financialization of the economy, uh, there's 5% of the population between the ages of 25 and 54 who don't have a job. Now, maybe they're the ones who voted for Trump. Okay? And on that front, why is there such a huge difference? The, the one series should be the mirror image of the other. The reason they're not is the unemployment data asks questions such as, are you out of work? Answer yes. Have you been out of work for more for less than a year? If you answer no, you've been out of work for more than a year, you're recorded as not being in the workforce. If you answer you've been unemployed for less than a year, but then say the guy says, Have you worked in the have you applied for a job in the last two weeks? If you answer there are no jobs to apply for, I haven't bothered you're also recorded as not being in the workforce. Right? Now, the employment data simply says, ask factories, how many workers do you have? So the employment stat's far more accurate in that sense than the unemployment data. And this is looking at the growth rate in America now between 1990 and today. And before the crisis occurred, the average rate of growth was 2.4% per annum. Since the crisis, it's averaged 1.15%. Now, how on earth could you have full employment with a growth rate that's less than half what it was before the crisis. It's fictional. Okay? So when Trump was saying there's fake statistics and fake data and understated levels of unemployment, he was right. Now, why is this happening? Well, American mainstream economists have dragged out an explanation they first had back in the Great Depression to try to explain the Great Depression, which, of course, was another event they didn't see coming and have never really given an adequate explanation for. But what they revived was the argument that there's a trend over time for the rate of growth to fall simply due to slower technological change and slower population growth. And if you look at that data, this is looking at the rate of economic growth now from America from 1950 to 2020, so virtually 70 years' worth of data. And what you can see is there is a downward trend. Okay. Now, the explanation that the mainstream give for this is that it's secular stagnation. That it's a, and this is Hansen's explanation back in 1939, uh, saying that there's falls in uh, lower technological change and lower population growth. This is 1939. This is before the invention of computers and nuclear power and jets. Okay, 
Do you think it's sensible to say that we had a lower technological growth? No, what we had was lower investment, less, less the te- technology being turned into products. But it's nonsense to argue there was low technical change to explain the Great Depression. Now, when he first made this exp- explanation, the unemployment rate in America, of course, had exploded during the Great Depression from a recorded level of zero on NBR data to 26% by 1932. It then declined sharply until 1936-37. And then in that year, Roosevelt was persuaded to try to balance the books of the government once more because people thought the crisis was over. Unemployment rose back up to 20% again. And at that stage, Hansen repeated the argument that there was secular stagnation. And what he thought was going to happen was unemployment was going to be at this high level, the indefinite future. Of course, that's what actually happened. It fell during the Second World War and it remained low during the 50s and 60s. So he was quite wrong back then. Now, 80 years later, another crisis occurs and Larry Summers dredges up this explanation for the 1930s, which was wrong, and he's now using it into the 2000s. And his argument fundamentally is the same basic argument. First of all, he says there's no financial crisis anymore. He says the financial crisis has been resolved and there are no major financial concerns today. That's the perspective. So he says, how can you explain it in the absence of financial concerns? How can you explain why growth remains low? And what he's doing is ignoring this data, which Hansen also ignored. The red line is the ratio of private debt to G- whoops, pardon me, private debt to GDP in America. And the blue line, and that's graphed on the left-hand axis over here. So we have a higher level of private debt now than back in the Great Depression. In both cases, the crisis preceded a peak in private debt, which then fell. And in both cases, we had a period where credit, which is the change in debt, was negative during the crisis and then positive afterwards. That's all being ignored. Back in the 1930s, the rate of growth of debt was actually as as low as minus 9% of GDP every year. And in the last crisis, it was minus 6% of GDP for a a, a brief period. So why do they ignore this? Well, the reason is they argue that private debt doesn't matter to the macro economy. And I want to show you why they think that and why they're wrong as well. So Krugman, again, is one of the main people pushing this belief and argues that debt is money we owe to ourselves and rising debt can actually be a good thing, nothing to worry about. And he gives an example of a two-class system where people who borrow money maybe have better chances to invest than those who don't. Now, I want to take a, a bit of a break here and ask, what do you think would have been the most successful way to manage your economy in 2007, given what's happened? Okay. And my argument is the best thing you could have done is listen to what mainstream economists tell you and expect the opposite. Okay. Because in 2007, two months before the crisis began, This is what the OECD was telling global leaders, was saying that uh, there's going to be, the the current situation is better than the last few years. Uh, Our forecast is quite benign. And they forecast strong job creation and falling unemployment. Now, given their track record, the most sensible thing you should have done then is panic. There's a crisis coming. Get ready for it. But within two months, that's when the crisis began. So if you look at the unemployment rate for a whole range of countries and say, when did the OECD predict strong job creation and falling unemployment? It was just two months before the crisis exploded. And unemployment was already rising in America when they made that forecast. And it more than doubled in the next two years. So doing the exact opposite of what they said would be the best policy. And even after the crisis began, they still couldn't see that they were in one. This is the chief economist for the Federal Reserve in December of 2007. And using mainstream economic modelling, he tells the Federal Reserve that growth is going to be back up towards potential in 2009. Now, in 2017, it's still nowhere near what they call potential growth. And they said a benign picture, no recession, and a bit of a a falling in in inflation. That's about about the main impact of it. When he made that prediction, that was when the NBR, actually now looking backwards, said that's when the, price, when the recession began. The same month he was saying there wouldn't be one. So this is how misleading their advice is. So if they say high public debt is a problem, which most a lot of them do, 
and private debt is not a problem, then maybe the opposite is true. Maybe public debt is not a problem and private debt is. And I want to show you why that's the case. So I'm going to use one of Krugman's own models now. He wrote a sophisticated, or well, pretty childish in my opinion, but what he would call a sophisticated model uh, in the a paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And if you take a look at the appendix of that paper, you can find a model where what they call a bank, which is actually a, a one a one year contract in a consumption good, uh, is not lent by the, the by the bank. The bank is simply an introduction agency that introduces a, a lending agent who is the consumer goods producer to a borrower who's the investment goods producer. So I've taken, and then the bank makes money by charging a fee. So I've taken that model and I've put it into my software package I call Minsky, which is open source, by the way. People are happy to download it and use it uh, themselves. So it's designed to model financial flows. And it divides uh, different bank accounts into assets, liabilities, and equity, and lets you then model financial flows. So here's the this is the reserves, which are not affected in the model. The consumer goods sector's deposit account, the investment sector's deposit account, workers' deposit account, and the bank's equity. And lending is from the consumer sector to the investment sector in this model. The investment sector then pays interest to the consumer sector. The consumer sector pays a fee to the bank. And then there's a range of normal economic activities, hiring workers, workers consuming, and so on. And Minsky takes care of the accounting to make sure you don't make any logical errors. That's what the row sum is doing there. So I put that all together. And if I then model this idea that banks are just intermediaries, if I wrap big changes to the level of lending, has no impact on the level of the economic activity. So this is now the software package. And I'm going to set it running. And this gives you the growth rate, level of GDP, and the debt to GDP ratio. And what Krugman was saying is big changes in debt don't really matter. They won't affect the macroeconomy. And debt might actually be a good thing rather than a bad thing. So I simulate this. First of all, the economy is not growing, as you can see. The growth rate is zero. And GDP is therefore constant. And the debt ratio is stabilized. If I now speed up lending so the debt ratio rises, almost nothing happens to the growth rate. If I slow down repayment so debt rises even more, Again, nothing much happens to GDP. And if I go back to the initial situation, so I have a, a, a dramatic reduction in the level of debt. Again, macroeconomy, not, nothing much happens. So on that basis, if they were right that their model structurally described the nature of lending, pardon me, my, my mouse is being a bit annoying here. Okay, I'll just drag that back. Um, there's no, no particular impact by changing the level of lending. So you can ignore the financial sector in modeling the macroeconomy. And that's what they do, of course, in mainstream economics. Now, I'm going to argue that's totally wrong and show you why. And the basic proposition I end up proving is that aggregate demand is the sum of the turnover of existing money, which is roughly measured by GDP, plus credit. I'm going to do it by dividing the economy into three sectors, and I'll show you that the, the sum of aggregate expenditure is the negative of the diagonal, whereas aggregate income is the sum of the off-diagonal elements. And what I'm showing is flows of monetary purchases between sectors in the economy in dollars per year. And I show all the flows in lowercase, all the stocks in uppercase. There's only one stock that matters, which is the level of private debt. Uh, and the first case I'm going to look at is where there's no borrowing or lending. So all I have here is sector one is spending A dollars per year on sector two and B dollars per year on sector three. Ditto for sector two on sector one and sector three on sectors one and two. And if you add up the, the diagonal and take the negative, that's aggregate expenditure. And if you add up the off-diagonal elements, that's aggregate income. And the two are necessarily equal to each other. Simple enough? Well, that's where there's no lending possible. Let's now imagine the model that the mainstream has where banks play no active role. They simply introduce sector one to sector two and then loan occurs between the sectors rather than from the bank. And, of course, if you have a, a flow of debt, then there must be an outstanding stock of debt. So I'm showing interest on that being row dollars per year 
and therefore sector to, to borrow money from sector two, sector one has to pay row times L dollars per year as interest income to sector two. So what I now have is a flow of L dollars per year from sector two to sector one, and then sector one spends that on sector three, and sector one pays interest to sector two. Just showing the financial flows that have been added now. Now, if you do your sums, you find that the interest payments become part of aggregate expenditure. And they're also part of aggregate income. So gross financial transactions become part of expenditure and income in that model. So that's slightly more, we're once taking one more step towards reality. What now if banks actually lend money? So now instead of borrowing from sector two, sector one is borrowing from the bank and paying interest to the bank. So I now have a flow of new loans of L dollars per year, an outstanding stock of L dollars of debt. The flow of dollars, new, new loans of L dollars per year increases the assets of the banking sector. It also increases the liabilities and then sector one uses that money to buy from sector three and pays interest to the banking sector. And the sec banking sector then uses that interest to buy off the other sectors. So I now I've got to add up four, off to four diagonal elements. And notice that credit now turns up as part of aggregate expenditure and also aggregate income. So in this basis, change in debt plays an essential role in aggregate expenditure and aggregate income. And therefore, you have to look at the economy as having two sources of monetary demand. The turnover of existing money plus new expenditure financed by debt. And if you leave the, leave the latter part out of your macroeconomics, you're ignoring a fundamental element of capitalism. Now, that just means that it comes down to a question is, who's right about the structure of lending? A mainstream economist correct that banks don't lend money. They're just introduction agencies like Ashley Madison. You all know about Ashley Madison? This room I can get a yes answer. I've been saying it to students. They don't know what I'm talking about. One of these days I'll probably find out. So this is the vision that the bank that the mainstream has. You know, banks don't actually lend you money. They're a bit like Ashley Madison. It doesn't actually screw you. They introduce you to somebody else who wants to screw you and they charge you a fee for the introduction. Pardon me being frank in a religious country, but I think it's the best way to make the analogy here. Now, I think, in fact, banks are a bit more like the red light district. They'll screw you for a fee. Okay. So those are the two visions of banking. Which one is more realistic? Well, if I show you what happens, well, fortunately for a long time, arguing the case that the, the red light district model of banking is more realistic has been something that's been done by non-mainstream economists like myself, beginning with a guy called Basil Moore. Richard Verne has done some marvellous work in this area as well, many, many others. But we've been arguing against the mainstream. And out of the blue, three years ago, the Bank of England published a marvellous paper called Money Creation in the Modern Economy, where they said, look, the non-Orthodox people are right. The textbooks are wrong. The reality of how money is created today differs from the description found in some economic textbooks. That really should read all the economics textbooks. There's only one or two that exist that actually teach the non-Orthodox view that is actually the real world. And saying rather than banks lending out deposits, Bank lending creates deposits, and the bank central bank doesn't fix the amount of money in circulation, and it's not money. It's not the money multiply model is also false. So I can now quote the Bank of England on that front. A marvelous paper. I recommend you, if you haven't seen it, download it and take a look. So if I model that in Minsky, all I have to do is go to the uh, the, the consumer sector's view of the economy of the economy here, and to, to, to delete debt as an asset of the consumer sector. It's still there as a liability of the investment sector. And delete the lending operations, which don't occur between the consumer sector and the investment sector, but actually occur between the investment sector and the banking sector. And if I now add an additional column for an asset for the banking sector, Minsky brings across the financial operations involved. And all I need to do now is show that the interest payment is made to the bank rather than made to the consumer sector. And if I now reset the model and rerun it, instantly you can see several things. For a start, the growth rate is positive. The economy is growing. The increase in debt 
which is shown down here, is causing an increase in the money supply. If I have an increase in the rate of lending, growth accelerates. If I have a slowdown in repayment, growth accelerates further, but so does debt. And then if you have a crunch where people start repaying their debt more rapidly and banks lend more slowly, you have an economic crisis. GDP falls. That's all it takes to show how different a model where credit plays a role is. That's just and how wrong, how totally misleading the model the mainstream has is the real real capitalism. So, and this now explains why the crisis occurred. The crisis occurred because the rate of growth of private debt slowed down. That's all it takes. And I want to show you how simple it is to illustrate the role of debt with an arithmetic example. Imagine an economy where I'm using turnover of existing money because we don't actually, uh, part of borrowed money is used to buy goods and services. The majority is used to buy assets. So I could simply say GDP if 100% of the money uh, that was borrowed was used to buy assets rather than goods and services. So for the sake of simplicity, I'll say that in this argument. So rather than turnover existing money, imagine GDP was a trillion dollars a year and it was growing a 10% per annum. And then imagine that private debt was 100% used to buy assets and it was 50% of GDP and growing at 20% per annum. Those are quite realistic numbers to use, by the way. Well, that would mean total demand in that economy would be 1.1 trillion. A trillion dollars from GDP, turnover of existing money, and 20% of 500 billion, which is $100 billion, being spent on assets. So total demand, 1.1 trillion. The next year, if GDP just continued growing at the same rate, 10%, you'd have a GDP or turnover of existing money of 1.1 trillion. If the growth rate of debt slowed down to being the same as GDP, so the debt ratio stabilised, credit would be 10% of $600 billion, which is $60 billion. So total demand would be $1.16 trillion. Now, that's still larger than the previous year, $60 billion larger. That's with a slow level of private debt. Now, what about where debt is 20% of GDP? And that's, sorry, 200%. And that's pretty much the level that applies in most of the OECD now. Well, in that case, in that first year, total amount would be 1.4 trillion. 1 trillion from turnover existing money and 400 billion, which is 20% of 2 trillion from credit. The next year, if GDP continued growing at the same rate, you'd have a 1.1 trillion dollar GDP. But credit would be 240 billion, which is 10% of 2.4 trillion. And total demand would be 1.34 trillion, which is 60 billion less than the year before. So demand would fall even though credit and GDP were both growing, were both still positive. So you can now get a rough measure for this by adding together GDP plus the change in debt to get a rough measure of total demand, monetary demand in the economy. And you can now see this is enough to indicate when the crisis occurred and why it occurred. So the, the red line is GDP for America. The blue line is GDP plus credit. You can see the crisis began literally when that sum peaked and started falling. The black line, which is graphed on the right-hand side, is credit as a percentage of GDP. And right from 1950 all the way through to 2008, that was never negative. The reason the crisis was so big was credit was actually negative in that, so subtracting from demand rather than adding to it. That's exactly the same thing that happened in Japan 25 years earlier. If we'd actually paid attention to monetary demand for goods and services and assets in a capitalist economy, Japan would have been the canary in the coal mine, a very big canary. That's the same data for Japan. Its crisis began in 1990. That's when GDP plus credit peaked, and it's never got back to the same level of demand since then because for most of the post-crisis post period, Credit's been negative down here. So credit plays an essential role because it is so volatile. It's now such a large part of total demand. And when you, when you work out the, the role of credit, you get ridiculous correlations like this. According to the mainstream, there should be no correlation between the level of credit and the level of employment. 
The correlation there is minus 0.91 for American data between 1990 and today. When you look at change in credit, that drives change in unemployment. The correlation there is minus 0.87. These are ludicrously high correlations for things that, according to mainstream theory, are not supposed to have any significant correlation whatsoever. And the crisis is continuing because we haven't reduced private debt enough. If you look back at the, the 1930s, that's the red line. In each case, I've indexed the level of debt to 100 for the start of each of these crises. And by, by 2000, by, by, by 15 years after the crisis, the level of private debt in America, which of course is 1945, was down to one third of what it was when the crisis began, a very low level of leverage. Japan at the same stage still had over 80% of the debt level that had when its crisis began. Fast forward to today, it's still got 80%. There has not been sufficient deleveraging to let the economy renew its growth levels. Now you look at uh, you can now use this combination of the level of private debt, which I've graphed on the horizontal axis, and the level of credit, which I've graphed on the vertical axis, to identify countries that are likely to have a problem. And anything over 1.5 times GDP and any credit level over 10% of GDP is likely to be a problem area. So that's, that's where I've identified the danger zone. And of course, China and Hong Kong and Ireland are massively in that area. Ireland started, by the way, as crazy. It's about as stable as Donald Trump. So I, I wouldn't take this data too seriously, but China and Hong Kong, a different story. And down here, Canada, Korea, Australia, Norway, Belgium, Sweden, quite a few countries. And also over here on the border passing into this region, Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand. So we might see a repeat of the Asian financial crisis. But the US, the UK and Japan have all turned Japanese because they've got stagnant economic growth because they have stagnant credit. And they're not going to get positive credit again until they get back over here somewhere. But of course, they're showing no no signs of going there. So that's that's the private, the private debt level. What about government debt? Well, the vision that the mainstream has of government debt is that over the long term it should be zero, or that the change in debt should be zero. It should be surpluses during booms, deficits during slumps. Over the long term, a balanced budget is the vision that most of them have. But when you think about it, there are actually three ways to create money in a capitalist economy. Banks can lend out more money than they get back in repayments, with, of course, the side effect of rising private debt. The government creates money by spending more than it gets back in taxes. And you can create money by having your trade volume exports exceeding imports. So your central bank then converts foreign currency into a domestic currency. Now, if the government tries to run a surplus, that's just like a bank wanting to have its repayments exceeding its new loans. Any bank that did that would ultimately disappear. Of course, they don't do that. So why should the government disappear? Now, if the government does do that, what it's doing is reducing the money supply. The government running a surplus is taking money out of circulation. And that'll cause the economy to slow down or cause private indebtedness to rise. The only way to counteract it is either to borrow more money from the banks or to run a trade surplus. So banks play as, as, as bad as governments may be, as inefficient as they are, as bureaucratic as they are, they play an essential role in creating money. And if you try to have them destroying money by running a surplus, then you're either going to have slower growth or rising private indebtedness or a crisis in the future, and normally a combination of all three. So rather than a surplus being a sign of putting aside money for a rainy day and therefore making you more secure, running a surplus is a likely a sign you're going to have a crisis in the near future. And that's what you see when you look at the American data, because rather than government surpluses preceding periods of economic tranquility, they precede periods of economic crisis because they help cause it. So this is the government surplus in America for the last 120 years. There's zero. There's the average, which is about minus 2.4%, so on average a deficit. They ran a surplus under Clinton before the financial crisis. And during the 1920s, they ran a surplus of 1% of GDP per year believing that was making the economy sound. Well, one was followed by the Great Depression, the other by the Great Recession. And when you look at it, a deficit of about 3% is normal and sensible for a growing economy. And the average for the United States, about 2.4% for the whole one and a quarter centuries. Leave out the second of the wars, about 2.2% of GDP. 
That's the sensible level. And that's what we should be teaching our students as well. So we're not teaching that. We're teaching what uh, a colleague of mine, Bill Black, uh, who was the, saving, the prosecutor for the savings and loans crisis and is now um, an econ economist at, um, and a lawyer at a, you know, a UMKC. He calls it theoclassical economics. It's more religion than a science. And suddenly we're getting neoclassical economists saying that themselves. So we have a, some, one economist saying we don't have a settled theory of macroeconomics. Another saying we should reject the assumptions because the assumptions are false. And a third one saying macro has gone backwards for more than 30 years. Now, normally, if I ask people who made those statements that they didn't know who was the source of them, I guess they'd reckon maybe the first two by me and the third by Dario. Okay. In fact, the first was by an ex-Federal Reserve president. The second was by Olivia Blanchard, ex-chief of the IMF. And the third is by Paul Romer, who's the new World Bank chief economist. So the mainstream are becoming critics of their own theory. And the reason is it's very hard to ignore reality. You can ignore it until things go wrong, then you can't ignore it. So they used to ignore the, they used to say assumptions don't matter when they were fighting ideological battles with the central planners and with non-orthodox economists. But if you try to manage an economy based on an ideological theory, you're going to have a crisis, which is what actually has happened. And that's what they're now realizing. And in fact, Paul Romer ends up saying the theories are so bad, you might as well call them post-real, they're fantasies. And he happily says that the models might as well have trolls changing wages and gremlins changing prices. They're that full of fantasy. They look mathematical, they look sophisticated. They're in fact fantastical inventions that bear no reality to the real world. And they fit the data well because you've got so many variables and so many stochastic parameters fit, but you leave out essential variables like private debt and credit, and you leave out non-equilibrium dynamics. So the economy is going to be systematically different to what you expect whenever there's a change in those trends you're not, you're not considering. So how do you cope with that? Well, again, what the mainstream says is you must build models from the ground up. And this is Olivia Blanchard, that same article, saying you must start from micro-foundations because it's hard to see where else you can start from. What I want to show you, you can actually build a model from the top down. You can start from simple definitions like employment, the employment ratio, the wages share of output, and the debt to GDP ratio. And you can derive a model of the macro economy from those definitions. So I'm going to rush through this bit, I'm afraid, because I know it's getting a bit late in the evening and I want a few chance to have a conversation as well. But I can take those three definitions, the employment rate, the wages share of output, and the debt to GDP ratio and derive three true, true by definition dynamic statements. The employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds population growth, labor productivity growth. Wage share of GDP will rise if wage rises exceed labor productivity. And the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Now, they're obvious statements and you can simply derive them. I'm gonna rush through this particular screen. It's just incredibly simple calculus. It might look complicated, but all you've got to do is take those expressions differentiate them with respect to time, phrase them in terms of each other, and you finally get the first explanation I've said. It's, that's all the mathematics it takes. That's putting it verbally. That, that equation here says the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds labour productivity growth and population growth. Same thing for the wages share of GDP. And the debt ratio is so obvious. The ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Okay. So you get those three truisms now. So how do you turn that into a model? Well, a simple insight from complexity theory is that getting the structure right is more important than getting the behavior of individual entities in a model right. So I can use incredibly simple definitions and just see what happens. And what I'm starting from is a constant capital output ratio, uh, labor productivity uh, determining uh, the level of work given the number of work, the number of output being produced, depreciation and investment, uh, constant population and technical change, debt financing investment, excess, excessive profits, a linear reaction by workers to employment and setting wages, and a linear reaction by capitalists to the rate of profit in determining investment. You put it all together, 
and you get a model that has inherent nonlinearities. Now it looks uh, a bit complicated, but it's pretty simple. The red things there are variables, the, the black are, are parameters. And what you have, apart from you know slightly scary for students, it shouldn't be too bad for academics, uh, you have let the employment rate multiplied by the wage or share and the debt ratio in one equation, the wage or share times employment in a second, and the debt ratio times the wage share in itself in the third. And that's what gives you the, the character of the model. And what you get out of is two potential classes of behavior. If you get a convergence to equilibrium, the black line there is the employment ratio, the, the reddish line is the ratio of debt to GDP, which is graphed on the right-hand axis. And that's heading to equilibrium. But you can also get what looks like a convergence followed by a breakdown with a much higher level of private debt. And I can simulate that in Minsky. So if I now start this model and I have a very low reaction by capitalists to the rate of, um, of, uh, in, of, of profit in terms of how much they wish to invest, then you get an obvious convergence to equilibrium going on over time. Actually, I'll see it slightly higher, but I'm getting negative debt, there, so I'll just actually give it a different value. So I get positive debt, but the system clearly stabilizes. So that's the equilibrium outcome. Now, if I make the capitalists more reactive to the rate of profit, so they're willing, willing to invest more with a higher rate of profit, what you get looks like convergence to equilibrium for a while, but it's got a falling wage and share. Notice the wage and share is falling, but that's rising inequality, and a rising debt ratio, and ultimately that system will break down. And that's what happened in the actual financial crisis, a period of apparent moderation followed by a breakdown. And that's what I saw when I did my PhD thesis back in the 90s. I got that dynamic, which is why I was aware the financial crisis is going to happen. So that's it's simple in that sense to build a model of capitalism that includes financial dynamics, non-equilibrium, and gives us a result much like the real world. This is a slightly more complicated model where I include price dynamics and nonlinear nonlinear behavior as well. And if I simulate this model, it's rather more complicated dynamics, but we see fundamentally what we saw in the financial crisis. Diminishing cycles initially, rising cycles, then it finally seems to settle down, but ultimately the whole system collapses. Just when it seems to become stable, employment collapses, and inequality rises as capitalists, well, bankers get more and more of the income at the expense of workers. Capitalists think everything is fine until ultimately they're paying everything to, to bankers. And the fall in what workers are taking is not compensated by the rise in what bankers get, and profit collapses and the economy collapses. That's an incredibly simple model in one sense. It's only one stage removed from the one I've shown you a moment ago. But it shows you the nature of what we've been through. And this is the sort of work we need to do to have a model of capitalism. That actually makes sense. So what about Mexico? Bring it back home, okay. <laughs> uh, well, you don't yet have problems with high credit and high debt. This is looking at the level of private and government debt in America in Mexico. And your private debt level is one quarter what it is in America, and your government debt level is one third. So you're not anywhere near in any financial financial straits as yet. When you look at the private debt and break it down into corporate versus household. Most of it that is corporate debt, that's actually better than being household debt. Uh, and there is a bit of a revival in debt levels going on right now, but it's actually it's, it's accelerating more slowly. So when you take a look at it, the actual rate of growth of credit is falling at the moment. And since the crisis began, this is the global financial crisis here, you had, first of all, a huge increase in credit, which led to a fall in unemployment. Now you've got declining credit and rising unemployment. So you've got problems about your demand levels rather than having a crisis, a, a false boom driven by credit dynamics, which is what actually led the Americans astray. So if you need to make reforms to your economy, now's the time to do it to avoid getting into financial problems. So you don't have any problems like America has. Your only problem really is America. Okay. On that note, uh, this is my next book, which talks about the financial crises. Is was mentioned comes out in April, May, and it's non-technical. I've left equations out of it. I've got equations on the supporting website, but I'm explaining why the crisis occurred, 
why we have stagnation and why a second round is coming, not in America and, the, and Europe and the UK, but in countries that managed to avoid the crisis last time round. And I'm also going to be starting in a panel on, on Patreon, which I'm happy to talk about later. And, of course, anybody wants to come along and study with me, come over to Kingston in the United Kingdom. Thank you very much.